Hello, Sharon. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Uh, an introduction. Um, so Sharon Burrow is a global advocate for human rights, climate action, and just transition. And you also are the former general secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation. Thank you again for being here today. Um, you, of course, you've become an influential advocate in your past role as general secretary of ITUC for more than 10 years. Tell us about the role that labor can play and should play in the energy transition. I was thinking I had a mic. <laughs> so labor recognized more than two decades ago that this would be the biggest systemic shift we would face in our lifetime. A, a shift that began with uh, fossil fuels, but actually an economic transition that uh, reaches across all sectors. So while it wasn't ever easy to convince people that we needed to be ahead of this, there was a general acceptance of a mandate uh, or a mantra that we established very, very early on, that the science is clear and that there will be no jobs on a dead planet. So it was on that basis that Labor fought for just transition, which we finally realised in the Paris Climate Agreement in 2015. But having said that, Labor is a microcosm of our society and the fear and insecurities of workers and uh, their fear for themselves, their families, their communities, the fact that they will be left behind is very real, it's palpable. And so what we need is to actually uh, change the way in which we work across the transition. And that means inclusion, it means consultation, it means designing the outcomes that make sure that there are jobs, that communities feel secure and that we protect the planet. How do we make sure that communities feel secure? Um, have you, are you aware of any trade unions that have demonstrated leadership in, in kind of the energy transition and um, any interesting examples that come to mind perhaps? So pick a country, I would say. If you start uh, indeed with the country that uh, kicked off the first commission around exiting from coal, it was an agreement with President Trudeau and the former Environment Minister, Catherine uh, McKenna, oversaw a commission that Labor, the employers and government, um, you know, initiated to talk to people to understand what it would take to make that transition fair. It was followed very uh, closely by Germany with their first coal transition. And then you saw broader institutional settings. So Scotland, Nick Robin sits on the just transition uh, uh, authority for Scotland, and they've now become a permanent institution, indeed with their own ministry. In Australia, we've just set up after, you know, I think almost 15 years of advocacy. It was certainly before I left Australia as the Labor of the leader, uh, the Labor leader there to go to the ITC, that we had put on the table a need for a net zero uh, authority or a transition authority. It's now established and the legislation's about to go through. That institutionalizes dialogues. You know, people ask about jobs. There are jobs in the transition, but we need to make sure the processes are there to actually uh, include planning across the most vulnerable uh, um, workplaces and their communities. You mentioned the word uh, fear, um, because for many people, it's their livelihoods. Uh, change can be daunting. Ha are you aware of uh, perhaps opposite examples of, of labor unions uh, resisting change? And, and what can we learn from that experience in order to, um, you know, in the future, uh, be able to, to respond to that? I think anybody will resist change if they're not included, if the planning is not uh, um, transparent, if there's not co-creation. We used to talk in the ITC about being at the table to design the plans to climate and employment proof our futures, our workplaces. Those processes are evident in a number of countries, but they're still sadly absent. Um, Bert is here, who is the uh, climate official for 
the ITUC, and he will tell you that while we might have won Just Transition in 2015, it's taken till indeed last year, 2023, to get a work plan, a formal work plan within the UNFCCC processes. But equally, companies that don't actually include workers from the beginning, don't negotiate or consult and negotiate where necessary with workers and their communities. Systemic says there's a figure of about a hundred billion dollars already of risk to climate finance. And that can only grow if people are not included and don't give a social license. Plus we see often these areas of, uh, of development and it has fantastic opportunities for place-based development. If you think that there are 27, for every 20 jobs in renewable energy, there are five to seven in manufacturing if they're good jobs, there's 30 to 35 in the broader community. But if all those jobs are indeed uh, somewhere else and you're not looking at uh, locational planning for communities, then you will get resistance and fear. And yeah, I can point to many examples around the world where people are still very fearful. But I can also point to great examples, you know, walking the, um, uh, the, uh, Coal, uh, coal mining areas in Spain, where you have a fantastic environmental, well, now she's deputy president, Teresa Rivera, but she was committed to just transition way back, even before it was uh, a, uh, you know, talked about at length in the UNFCCC processes. She's put in place not just an authority, but prior to that, after consultation with unions and communities, you know, the means to actually help those communities transition. Now, when you actually, uh, initially, when you walk through those communities, yeah, there was anger, there was fear, there was resistance, because that's normal. But when they understand that they can have a stake, that they'll be supported in securing a future, then people tend to be rational and get on with the job. But if you ignore people, then of course, that's a different story. A social license is essential to economic uh, uh, success as well as project development and job success. And that means inclusion of people from the beginning. I know you're gonna talk about indigenous uh, uh, people with, uh, with you know, a, a further speaker, but can I say that the attitude shift where you have indigenous landowners, for example, is very slow. So there's still this sense that uh, it's a bit like the old mining adage, we've got a right to prospect. Well, these are indigenous lands. And if you see these, uh, these landowners as equity partners, not as stakeholders, not as simply people who, you know, are going to be oppositional, then there are projects around the world that community unions are supporting indigenous owners for renewable energy development. And they're magnificent because everybody is indeed on the uh, on the path, is supporting the development. You mentioned for every five jobs in the renewable sector, um, more jobs will be created in manufacturing. There's this negative perception, though, that the energy transition will lead to a loss of jobs and that jobs will go from one place to the other. Um, how, I mean, how real is that concern? Uh, it is, is it a myth? And in, in your opinion, what is the energy marketplace, job marketplace going to look like in the future, resulting from the transition that we're going through? So it all depends on the design. We know that there are jobs in the energy transition. Locational issues are of course significant. So when there is no uh, wind or solar in a place where there was a coal fired power station or a coal mine, then you have to look at community renewal. But we also know that there are jobs in not just energy, but as if you think of energy as a foundation, upstream and downstream processing, there's massive jobs and opportunities for place-based development that we haven't seen. So you think about where you mine iron ore, if you could actually mine it with uh, um, renewable energy, perhaps with green hydrogen, um, where it's, it's high intensity heat, Certainly you could clean up the iron, but you could also build clean steel factories. 
and use again green hydrogen like Sweden did with the Swedish um, company SSAB, the unions and the government. They've proven you can do these things. We've got to clean up steel, aluminium, cement. We have to build circular economy capacity for all of our uh, um, material use. We have to look at where there are jobs in transport and logistics that are associated with this. And that's a massive transition in itself as we move to clean transport and mobility generally. And then there are associated jobs, uh, not just in finance, but in, um, in areas of services, because you can't uh, operate any of these projects without finance, legal, administrative services. And all of those build jobs in communities. If you look more broadly at the ecosystem, then you also need skills. We have a huge deficit that's actually frightening in terms of the um, skilled labor to do the jobs that it requires us to uh, provide in terms of transition. So if in fact we don't uh, look to trade teachers, for example, where there are more jobs and how you actually increase numbers of trade teachers, then we're not gonna fill those positions. And of course we need community services. So the resilience of the care economy, health, education, childcare, aged care, these are indeed jobs. So while these jobs are all not new jobs, we have got the capacity to protect and grow jobs if we in fact look at an integrated approach to planning, co-development, transparency, and indeed investment in place-based uh, um, issues of, of community building. In a way, do you have to think maybe kind of creatively outside the box in the sense that a job that's been lost in one sector of one sector of the economy, energy is not going to be replaced necessarily by another job in, in renewables and clean energy. I mean, is it, do you have to think creatively about how you will replace those lost jobs? So you won't always replace jobs one for one, but again, workforces aren't uh, static. If you think about uh, jobs in coal mining, for example, then the majority of coal miners are in fact uh, somewhere towards retirement age. And so if you provided secure pensions and a bridge to, to, and, and a bridge to secure pensions for early retirees, if you look at how you actually uh, retrain, reskill, and, uh, and move people into other roles, if you have community renewal planning, if you have the finance that includes just transition, then this actually is part and parcel of our economic development. You know, our economies haven't stood still. The telecommunications industry is uh, not what it was when I was a child and people plugged, you know, cables into holes to find the right uh, party line. It's now a massive industry and it's now underpinning and growing into digitalization, into our everyday lives, our utilities, our cars. So I find it frustrating when people talk about the notion of one for one. If you have planning across communities, across sectors, and indeed if you build in and price in the cost of just transition processes, into projects, then workers win and communities win. Um, you are from Australia. Um, I am. And you've mentioned coal mining uh, several times now, Australia being a big exporter of coal. Um, how is the country preparing for um, the, the progressive um, phase down of, of coal? Um, well, first of all, we have one of the most uh, responsible coal mining leaders. When I was president of the Australian Council of Trade Unions, Tony Ma, who's the head of the coal miners union, was actually the chair of my environment committee. So there is no, there is no disillusion amongst coal miners. What they want is secure jobs for themselves, their children and their grandchildren. They want their communities to grow. Australia's issue with coal is not so much uh, anymore. It's rapidly declining in terms of um, uh, the energy source for Australia. It's out the export market. So as demand ceases in other countries, 
then the inevitable decline of the, uh, the, the coal sector is there. It needs to be rapid, it needs to be planned for, but the net zero authority in part, while it has a, a, um, a whole of economy approach, it is indeed set up to look at what just transition means for those workers and their communities. Looking at the energy labor market, um, do you see any major kind of income, gender, socioeconomic gaps and, and why does it matter in the context of the energy transition? So on gender, it's a pretty shocking picture. If you start with skilled trades, then less than 10% of any apprenticeship uh, cohort is indeed uh, occupied by women. If you look at uh, engineers, then we do better with engineer graduates in numbers. But if you look at the employment, then pretty much that 10% into the energy market is a high bar, into the energy employment market is a high bar. This is exclusionary and our, and our workplace cultures have not shifted. So a lot of the cultures are cultures that are not welcoming to women, not just women, I might say, but uh, we haven't equipped our workplaces to deal with uh, workers with disability or to deal with mental health. And uh, indeed, even uh, racism still continues to exist despite the fact that we are really dependent on migrant workers for skilled labour deficits. So have we got the equality story right? No. Do we need to shift markedly the number, the, the uh, workplace cultures? Yes. There are good initiatives in my country and around the world. I've just finished a job for our Victorian government on reform of its apprenticeship system and what needs to happen. So you can find the solutions, but we really do have to say, if we need to, to, to uh, you know, double the number of electricians, quadruple the number of, uh, you know, uh, um, green economy engineers, et cetera, then you can't do that if we're not inclusive of everybody and encouraging these career pathways from our schooling system, which is sadly also still in deficit. You are the current commissioner for the Global Commission on Climate Governance, um, which aims to fill any crucial gaps in, in our response to the climate emergency. What are some of the kind of main gaps that you have identified and how do you fix that? So we have a planetary emergency and yet we don't have a global governance structure to deal with it. If you think that the planetary boundaries are um, the, the story of what re natural resources our planet actually holds and, uh, and the destruction to those planetary boundaries, we've already transgressed six of the nine planetary boundaries, yet more than 56% of GDP of our business activity is actually dependent on nature and associated planetary boundaries. We don't account for it. We account for GDP. We don't account for the uh, planetary boundaries. And yet these are integrated systems. So if we're going to have uh, indeed success in protecting our planet, then everybody understands the role of sovereignty and na national security. But there are some things that go beyond that. You know, if, even if you look at oxygen, for example, not many people will rattle off statistics like one in six oxygen molecules comes from the Amazon and we all share that. Not many people will tell you that our pharmaceutical industry, which protects our health and indeed protects us from, uh, from pandemics, is a strong biodiversity. Not many people will look at the value of nature that actually underpins companies' uh, business practices. So we have to change the way we think. We should start with uh, the UN declaring a planetary emergency. We would then urge that um, the UN Secretary General who's very committed to the Common Agenda Summit following, of course, the, this year's future um, uh, summit, then, or Summit of the Future, then, you know, in that common agenda summit, he's already put the social contract 
at the heart of our common uh, agenda for a shared future or a common security. It has to be an eco-social contract because you can't, you know, manage a planet. You can't govern a planet that has planetary uh, commons on which we all depend if we don't return to what it is that we're guaranteeing people in terms of inclusiveness, in terms of equality, in terms of security. But you also need to, to understand, and we understand well, that uh, indeed we all depend on nature, on those planetary boundaries. So we have work to do to change the way we account for um, our common security, but that means our common wealth, because just looking at GDP is actually denying the reality of the damage we're doing to our own future, the, uh, the planet, which is the only home we have. We have time for one final question, um, which is going to be uh, a question that will come up again and again for each guest. Um, so if you had a magic wand um, and could change anything um, for a better world, more sustainable planet, what would it be? So I'm going to say two quick things. For people, it has to be an eco-social contract. If we don't start consulting, including people, then the social fragmentation you're seeing today, pick an issue. The farmers across Europe in the last few weeks, you know, the floods and the fires that are destroying people and insurance industry no longer insuring mortgage, uh, mortgages for working uh, families in, the, in California, in the US, out of a, a cost beyond people's capacity in other countries, pick an issue. If we don't actually say the heart of dignity is indeed full employment with decent work, with rights, with a capacity to know that you've got a secure future. If we don't look at then the environmental dependency we have and how to integrate that into our global accounting systems, then we're not serious. So we have to put people and the planet at the heart of our economic planning. And for me, that means really rethinking the eco-social contract that it's the heart of our future. For, for climate action, the speed and scale we need, I would say the, the old controversial issue of a carbon price still looms large. You can't have... Um, the, the destruction of the polluting entities we have today who are, have an unfair advantage, not just against the planet and our own future, but against the companies who are transitioning and pretend that we are managing a, uh, a, a transition that will be sustainable. So a carbon price at the heart of the choices, you then make a choice, is it more affordable to actually uh, transition to a, to a secure, sustainable future for people and planet? Or do you want to continue your destructive uh, economic uh, op uh, um, uh, operations? Well, then it will come at a cost that's increasingly unaffordable. I know we're not going to achieve a carbon price overnight, but it's a conceptual frame. We have to make the polluters pay. Those people who will not work with communities, with workers, with governments, to make the transition. And I think I don't have to tell you that our fossil fuel companies, not all of them, but the bulk of them are still calling the shots when they should be using their technology, their capex, their skilled workforce, their infrastructure to protect and grow jobs in renewable energy. Thank you so much, Sharon Burrow. A round of applause for Sharon Burrow.